a brief series through the book of First Peter. And I, I think you'll see how powerful and relevant this book is. But let's just begin with this thought here from verse 1, how the letter begins. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, first of all, we have the author of the letter. It's Peter, and you all know Peter. Peter, uh, the, probably the second most prominent man in the Gospels after Jesus himself. Uh, Peter, the same one who walked on the water and who sank in the water. Peter, the same one who confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and Peter, the same one who was rebuked by Jesus just a moment later. Uh, Peter, the same one who protested that he would never deny Christ, and then a few minutes later, he did deny Christ, and the Peter who was restored from his denial by Jesus along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. This Peter is writing, and he writes, as you notice verse one says, as an apostle. Now what I find fascinating about this is to compare this just a little bit with Paul's letters. You know, most of the New Testament letters were written by the apostle Paul. This is one of only two letters written by Peter. When Paul introduces himself in his letters, it always has a phrase something like this, Paul, an apostle by the will of God. Something very similar to that. You notice Peter doesn't do that in this letter. And I think one reason why is that Paul was an apostle born out of due time. Peter was an apostle from the very beginning. To put it bluntly, nobody questioned Peter's apostolic credentials. So he just, I'm that Peter, Peter, an apostle, notice who he writes to, of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He addresses the Christians that he writes to here in the first century, uh, and he's probably writing uh, around the year 64 AD. That's what most scholars think, somewhere around there. So we're talking about maybe 30 years or so after Jesus has ascended to heaven. He's writing to them, and the first thing he calls these believers are pilgrims. Now, you, you understand what the idea of a pilgrim is? We're coming up to Thanksgiving, so we're thinking of the pilgrims, and we think of the guys with the Quaker Oats hats, you know, and the buckles on their shoes. Well, th those people were called pilgrims because they didn't settle down in one place. They were looking for a place to settle down, and that's what a pilgrim is. A pilgrim is someone who has not yet settled down in a place but is searching for a place to settle down. Now, our place as believers to settle down is not in this world. Our place as believers to settle down is in heaven. And that's why the idea of a heavenly hope hangs with such prominence throughout this letter of 1 Peter. It's in the very first verse. When he uses the title pilgrims, he's pointing towards heaven. And I want you to know that in some circles within the Christian world today, it's very popular to advance this idea that being a Christian isn't just about going to heaven. You know, the Bible really focuses is on what we do in the world here and now. Now, believe me, I would be the first one to say that being a Christian is not only about going to heaven. But if you read the New Testament, it puts a lot of emphasis on heaven. And it stirs up a heavenly hope. And even the mention of the word pilgrim sort of suggests that for us. So he's writing to pilgrims, but notice from a particular place of the dispersion, which is kind of an interesting phrase or word that he uses there, he's writing to Christians mainly from a Gentile background. We see that from later on in the letter, especially verse 18, this very chapter. But he calls them pilgrims of the dispersion, the dispersion being a reference to when the ancient Jews were dispersed throughout the Babylonian Empire. What he's just trying to say is, you guys are dispersed into the world, you don't have a, a center homeland, but you're pilgrims waiting for your homeland, just like the Jews after the Babylonian exile. And, and then he mentions the cities where they're gathered, you see it there in verse one, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, all of these places that he mentions, and on a map we could show you this, all of these places that he mentions are places, what would be today modern day Turkey. Uh, northern, southern, all the just general area there. And, and the first thing I want you to notice by this 
is because he mentions all these different regions in the area of Turkey. One thing I want you to be aware of is this was a letter not written to a specific congregation. Now Paul's letters, for the most part, were written to specific congregations and usually to address a specific problem in that congregation. Oh no, there's heresy in Colossa. I gotta write a letter. Oh no, there's arguments in Philippi. I gotta write a letter. Oh no, they've gone off the rails again in Corinth. I gotta write a letter. First Peter's very different. It is one of what we call one of the general epistles. First Peter, second Peter, uh, James, 1 Peter, uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, general epistles, epistles not written, or letters, I'm using kind of the churchy word for it, epistles there, letters written not to one specific congregation, but to Christians in general. Now, I, I just want that to sink in with you just for a moment here. Understand that we as Christians in general need to be taught about the Christian life. You know, some things are so obvious for us as believers that we don't really see them and think about them. But this is something that our age right here, right now needs to hear. We live in such an individualistic age. We live in an age where all of y'all got instant access to information from your smartphone, not to mention your tablet or your personal computer, and you could look up all the facts about this or that or the anything just like that, it's very easy for us to think in our modern age, I don't need anybody to teach me nothing. I can figure it out. Look, it's out there. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanna show you that just a basic principle behind these letters of the New Testament, especially the general letters is, you and I, we're all in this together, let's just say we, we need to be taught how to live God's way. We do. And, and it shows us a fundamental principle. We must submit ourselves to the word of God. Wh whatever it says in here how we should live, we need to take that seriously. We need to say, listen, God, you helping me, I want my life to conform to that. You moving in my life, I want to be able to fulfill that. I don't have the choice. It's just, nah, I don't need that. I can figure this out. No, we need to submit ourselves to the word of God. One other thought, and if I could ask, put up that map just one more time to show these cities. When you see the region where that is, uh, listen, uh, there were many Christians there in the day that Peter wrote uh, through the centuries. This has been a highly Christianized area. This is the modern uh, nation of Turkey, and there is almost no Christian presence in Turkey today, percentage-wise. Um, our congregation supports a pastor and his church in Istanbul. You should think, pray for the Christians of Turkey. Pray that God's work there advances. Because this very area where Peter originally wrote the letter to, which has had a strong Christian presence through the centuries, has very, very little Christian presence for the last hundred years. Okay, going on now to verse two. Uh, he's gonna describe the people that he's writing to. They are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. So you believers, you're elect. In other words, God chose you and he chose you, notice there in verse two, according to foreknowledge. In other words, God chose you, but not in a random way. We all understand that God chooses, but how does God choose? He chooses according to his foreknowledge, according to his wisdom. In other words, God doesn't look over the human race and just kind of say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, those are the ones I choose. No, there is wisdom and knowledge and, 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 and forethought within his cho choice. Now. I don't really believe that foreknowledge connecting with election means that God chooses me only because I choose him. <laughs> that would mean basically there's no choosing on God's part whatsoever. But I believe that God's knowledge of who I am, of what my destiny is, of what I will do with my life, of my inclinations, that it plays some role in whatever it is that he chooses. 
But the big picture is God's choice of us isn't random as believers. It's done with knowledge and forethought. But notice this. We are chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience. Christians are chosen, but they are chosen in sanctification and for obedience. If you think the whole point of you being chosen by God is saying, hey man, God chose me, I got my ticket to heaven, I can live any way I want, I wonder if you're chosen at all. Because the choosing that God describes is a choosing that is for sanctification or holiness and for obedience. This is just basic, fundamental to Christian thinking here. And again, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Now, he's going to give thanks to God the Father here, now starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I want you to notice how Peter begins this letter. He gives his greeting, his few introductory words, and then he says, let's talk about, let me explain to you what God did when he rescued us. Let me explain to you what God did when when we became born again, how you were saved, if you want to use that term, how God rescued, what he did. Now again, this is such an important principle and one that's so difficult for us in our modern age. In our modern age, we are so practical and pragmatic. We say, okay, you, pastor, you said I need help in my Christian life. Great, tell me what to do. Come on, give me a list. Give me the three things I gotta do to live a successful Christian life. Come on, I, I wanna do. One, two, three, do. I want you to notice, in those few verses in which he begins, there's no doing. It's about what God has done. He says, listen, before I tell you what to do, and there's gonna be plenty of doing for us to do in the letter of 1 Peter, but it's all founded on this basis of you got to understand what God has done in your life. Do you really understand? Do you understand what God has done in the realm of the spirit? There is a spiritual world that we interact with every day, but many of us are in some ways blind to it. We ignore it. Peter's trying to open our eyes to the spiritual reality of what happened when God rescued us. So he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's praising God for his unbelievable plan where, he says, he has, verse three, begotten us again. Now, when he says begotten us again in verse three, it's different from John chapter three, the gospel of John, where it talks about being born again or born from above. It's different wording, but it's the same idea. We're born again, we're given new life in Jesus Christ. Peter's idea is that when a person is rescued by God, when they are saved, they're made a new creation in Jesus Christ. And you were born again, verse three, to a living hope. Why is the hope living? Look at what it says there in verse three. It's a living hope because it comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the dead. I mean, if a hope comes to you through the resurrected Jesus, it's going to be a living hope. You know, maybe some dead Buddha can give you a dead hope. Maybe dead Muhammad the prophet can give you a dead hope. The risen Jesus Christ deals with a living hope. And he wants that hope to be alive in each and every one of us. So the hope lives because it's set on, verse 4, inheritance, inheritance incorruptible. It's an inheritance that can never go away. It can never fade away because it's reserved in heaven. Again, a heavenly look in 1 Peter. When God rescued you, he gave you an inheritance. Have you ever dreamed of a big inheritance? You know, oh, I had an uncle who I never knew, and he died, and he left me a jillion dollars. You know, wow, 
Well, let me tell you something about that jillion dollars. You don't know what's going to happen in the financial world in the next six months or year or ten years. That, That could be a very corruptible inheritance, right? Let me tell you something, though. The inheritance that God gives us in Jesus Christ, it's incorruptible and it's reserved for us in heaven. This is his message. So it's, verse 4, incorruptible, undefiled. It does not fade away. Now, I want you to notice, he's not really telling us what our inheritance is. He's telling us what it is not. It's not corruptible. It's not defiled. It does not fade away. It's almost as if what it is is too great to describe. So all Peter can tell us is what it is not. By the way, I just had a thought when you consider this kind of thing. I I think about when we talk to people about faith in Jesus Christ. And and there are times when, if we're going to tell people about God's word and God's work and all that, there are going to be times when we have to warn people about hell. It's not exactly my favorite thing to do. I don't know about you, but it, I mean, it's real. So there's a, there's a place for doing that. But not only should I or should we warn people about hell, but a second warning that we can give, or maybe it should be our first warning, is on what they will miss out on in heaven. It's not just that hell is a bad place, which it is. Heaven's a great place. And as much as it's bad to go to hell, it is unbelievable glorious to be in heaven. So it's not just the the penalty you'll deserve, it's the reward you'll be denied or the inheritance. And these are the ones, verse five, who are kept by the power of God through faith. This makes our inheritance certain. We are kept by the power of God and this enables us to endure through faith until the coming of Jesus. Um, Notice, we're kept by the power of God, but how? Through faith. That means your faith and my faith. The person who is kept is the person who's abiding in a continual relationship of faith with God. Faith and the preserving power of God work together and keep the believer. Now, he continues on, but notice verse 6 is going to introduce some difficulty that they're having right then. Look at verse 6. He says, In this you rejoice, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom... Having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So we rejoice. In this you rejoice. What do we rejoice in? We rejoice in the idea that we have an incorruptible inheritance in heaven. Now again, friends, I, I want you to understand. I get it how some Christians can kind of live this dreamy, pie in the sky, you know, sometimes the cliche that's used, you're so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly good. I understand there's an extreme like that out there, but can you please understand what Peter's saying here? He holds the hope of heavenly reward right in front of believers and says, this is important for you to hold on to. That, That you shouldn't think that primarily The end of God's plan is the salvation of this whole world that we live in, but it's heaven above. Now, we rejoice in that heavenly inheritance to come, but notice this, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And first of all, when you say various trials, these are bad trials because he uses the analogy later on in verse seven that you're being tested by fire. Fire, bad trial. It, this, this isn't like a, a heating pad. This is like an open flame. I want you to notice something there. Verse 6, he says, If need be, you have been grieved. Sometimes it is thought that if you were a real Christian, come on now, if you really trusted Jesus, you'd never be grieved in a trial. If you really trusted Jesus, 
You'd be like the spiritual Superman. Go ahead, shoot the bullets of adversity at me, and they just all bounce off me. Ha, ha, ha. Nothing affects me. I want you to notice, not only does Peter say that the trial itself is necessary, but there are times when our grief in the trial is necessary. God never has the expectation that we would go through trials and adversity with this stoic, Dr. Spock-like, I am never shaken by anything. No. And let me tell you, there are times when God knows we need the grief. That's a slogan for you. You need the grief. Sometimes we do. If, look at verse 6. If need be, you have been grieved. There is a need be, not only for the various trials, but more especially there's a need be for being grieved itself. God has a purpose not only for the trial, but also for the heavy grief that we bear in the midst of the trial. Now, some of you, right now, you're in a season of difficulty or trial, and you are grieved in the midst of it, and you think, I must be so out of God's will, because if I was in God's will, I would be just ecstatically happy all the time. Ladies and gentlemen, that's, not only is that not Christianity, I don't even think that's sanity. Do you ever read the Psalms? Do you ever see how God deals with us with the whole complexity of all of our human emotions and behaviors? No, there, there's a season to be unbelievably happy. Praise the Lord for that. And there is a season where God appoints grief for our life. And he has things to teach us in that. What Peter's saying is, look, I know you got this inheritance in heaven above. Don't be shaken up if you're in a season of grief. Why? Verse 7, because your faith is being tested by fire. Our faith isn't tested because God doesn't know how much faith we have or what kind of faith we have. Our faith is tested because we are often ignorant of our own faith. God's purpose in testing our faith is to display the enduring quality of our faith. And you want to know how important that is? Look how precious your faith is to God. Verse 7, it's much more precious than the gold that perishes. Now, isn't gold refined by fire? And if you would refine gold with fire, and gold's a pretty precious thing, how much more than our faith, which is much more precious than gold? You know, it's funny, gold is one of the most durable of all metals. Uh, just a week or so ago, Ingle and I were on vacation and we, we went to Israel and we were floating in the Dead Sea. And if you float in the Dead Sea, you want to take off all your jewelry and stuff. Well, I had my wedding ring on and I said to my wife, I said, Ingle, do I have to take my wedding ring off? She goes, no way, gold won't, won't hurt it in the Dead Sea. And it didn't, it's just fine. I mean, gold's pretty durable metal. But even it will perish someday, but not the result that comes from our faith. It's even more precious than gold that perishes. And at the end of it all, verse 9, we will receive the end of your faith. The end of your faith is the return of Jesus and the ultimate salvation of your soul. Testing and trials are inevitable as long as we are on this side of the end of our faith. As long as we do not yet see the God we serve we have to endure through trials and face them with faith and joy. So I want you to notice, Peter's encouraging some discouraged believers, isn't he? Here's your heavenly hope. Hang in there. I know you're being tested, but the result of this is worth it. The result of this is something that's more precious and more durable than gold. Hang in there to the end. Do not give up in such times. Now verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which they have now been reported to you 
through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Friends, those uh, three verses are very thick with information. But he's talking about the revelation of this salvation that we receive. Okay, so you, you got a heavenly inheritance. Did we get that? You're going through some trials now, but that's storing up some of your heavenly inheritance. Well, this whole plan that God does to give us this in Jesus Christ, to give us new life in Jesus, but Peter's trying to tell us it's nothing new. God had this planned out a long time ago. He says in verse 10, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. It was very important to Peter and to other New Testament writers to demonstrate that what the Bible speaks about what God would do through the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was not a novelty. He spoke about it in the Old Testament. It was testified beforehand by the prophets. They, as a matter of fact, verse 10, they prophesied of the grace that would come to you. You see, the prophets of the Old Testament longed to see the grace of the new covenant to come. They prophesied having some knowledge of what was to come, but so much less than they really wanted to know. Think about it. Um, how much would Isaiah have loved to read the Gospel of John? Can you imagine that? I bet you're going to be able to pick out Isaiah in heaven. He's going to be just one reading the Gospel of John over and over again. You know, think about all those amazing Old Testament prophets. Man, they searched, they looked into it. They're like, wow, we spoke about this ahead of time, and we only had a shadowy understanding of what this was going to be. But here it is, all revealed. And then in verse 12 says, To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering. The prophets understood that they were ministering to people far beyond themselves as well as to people in their own day. And these things the prophets predicted were reported as finished fact by the apostles. Look at verse 12. The things which now have been reported to you through those who preach the gospel. So Peter's saying, the things we apostles told you that happened in the person and the work of Jesus, all of that was predicted in the Old Testament. We brought it to you right here, right now. And then he says, verse 12, the things which angels desire to look into. Okay, is that like the main point of what Peter's talking about here? No, it's a side point. He's telling us about an heavenly inheritance, about enduring through trials, how it's nothing new, but the Old Testament prophets predicted it. And then he just gives this little throwaway line, things which the angels desire to look into. Doesn't that blow your mind? There are angels studying us right now. I don't say that to freak you out. But they, they, they long to know what we're doing. God is using us to teach angelic beings. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3. All give to us the idea that we are under angelic observation. And Peter just says it as a tantalizing throwaway line but it's, it's really fascinating for us to grab a hold of and to consider. All right now, verse 13. Therefore, okay, you wanted something to do? You, you can't, okay, just tell me what to do. Peter says, I'll tell you what to do, but in good time. First, let me tell you about your heavenly inheritance. Let me tell you that it's okay that your faith is gonna be tested. Let, let me tell you that, that this is nothing new, but God planned it out a long time ago. Now I'll tell you what to do. Verse 13, therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy and if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear. What does he do? First of all, you got to get serious. Verse 13, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind? What does that even mean? Well, 
He's using an ancient figure of speech where to gird up the loins was to fasten the belt you had. You know, they robed these robes, these tunics. And if you were gonna do some work, you know, if you were gonna, you, you had to take up your, your robe and tuck it into your belt, tuck your robe into your belt. That's what he means by gird of the lines. We would use the figure of speech today, roll up your sleeves and get ready to work. That's what he's saying. How about this? Roll up the sleeves of your mind. In other words, get ready to work with your head, with the way that you think. Be sober. That means the ability to take a serious look at life. It means to control what you think about, to control the things you decide to set your mind upon. I'm going to say something that is an absolute revolutionary concept to some of you. It is possible in Jesus Christ to control what you set your mind upon. You don't have to set your mind on things that are impure, on things that are silly, on things that are fruitless, on things that are crazy. You can set your mind on things that are good, honorable, beautiful, helpful, fruitful before God. This is really possible in Jesus Christ. And, And this is where the battleground is. So that's the first thing he says. Look, you you want something to do in your Christian life? Realize the battleground is there in your mind. And what should you do with your mind? Look at it there in verse 13. Rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He can't stop talking about heaven. What is the revelation of Jesus Christ and the hope that's going to start thinking about the return of Jesus and how glorious that's going to be? Now look. I don't know when Jesus is coming back again. I hope it's soon. I look at the situation in the world around us. I go, man, I don't know if it can get any crazier. I really don't. And you think, this is, this is a crazy time. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But I'll tell you, whether Jesus comes back for me or I go to him first, I got to get ready to meet him. There's going to come a day when Jesus Christ is revealed to me fully either because I go to him or he comes to me. So I have to rest my hope upon that day. The only way we can do that is to receive the grace that is to be brought to you. Now, I I love that phrasing there in verse 13. Notice what he says, the grace that is to be brought to you. That's about grace in the future. There's a, a message I've done a few times. It's been so long I've done it, but I, I call it grace, past, present, and future. Because the Bible talks about grace that was given to us in the past. It talks about grace that we walk in right now, and here's grace that's gonna be given to us in the future. Our life with God is grace, past, present, and future. Set your mind upon that. Wouldn't it be horrible if you believed in Jesus Christ your whole life, if you suffered things for him, if you sacrificed things for him, and when Jesus came, he was ticked off at you? Wouldn't that be awful? No, no, no. Rest your hope fully on the grace that's going to be revealed to you on that very day. And therefore, verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. In other words, live as obedient children. Verse 15, live holy. Now notice, to live as obedient children, as it says in verse 14, and to live holy, as it says in verse 15, I'll talk about holiness in just a moment. I need to make this point first, though. That's our actions, isn't it? Primarily dealing with our actions. I want you to notice something. He spoke to the mind before he spoke to the actions. Do you see how important that is? This is why the word of God has such a huge place in our own pure living and sanctification before the Lord. We need to be bringing the word of God into our life, reading it, listening to it, memorizing it, thinking about it, meditating on it. Because what we need is what the Apostle Paul called in the book of Romans, the renewing of our mind. And Peter felt the same way. 
because before he addressed our actions, he spoke to gird up the loins, roll up the sleeves of your mind. We deal with that first, and then out of that flows a holier life. And that's why I want to speak out here in verse 15. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. You know, um, it's hard to think of a word that sounds more old-fashioned and out of place in the church today than the word holiness. When you hear the word holiness, don't you think of an angry man shaking a bony finger in your face? Ladies and gentlemen, the holiness of God is beautiful. The holiness of God is majestic. The holiness of God is part of what makes God God. And God looks at us and says, I am separate from sin and shame and impurity and the ways of this world. I want you to be holy as well. I pray, and listen, I believe it'll happen. Because these things just kind of run in cycles. And God is always bringing back a fresh work. I don't despair on this, but I pray for this. I pray that a whole new young generation will come to a new appreciation of the holiness of God and, and learn to love it and treasure it and see how the holiness of God transfers into a holiness of life. That's why God comes to us and he says, be holy for I am holy. And then verse 17, and if you call upon the Father, you know, look, if you're gonna call upon the Father then you realize a holy life is connected with all this. Now, let's take a look at the last few verses. This motivation for godly living. Verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you through him, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now understand this, he says, this work that God did in your life, it was not done with corruptible things. Knowing this, verse 18 You were not redeemed with corruptible things. You were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. And if I could put it very bluntly, we weren't redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus so that we could go out and live like garbage. That's not why he did it. He came to redeem us from that garbage life, not to it. Matter of fact, verse 18, to save us from your aimless conduct received by tradition by your fathers. This is the frame of mind that seeks to be justified by the law. It's aimless conduct. It it seems to have an aim of rescuing yourself by good works, but it's aimless because it can't succeed. Instead, God did what we couldn't do. Verse 19, he sent a lamb without blemish and without spot. And he was foreordained before the foundation of the world to make the sacrifice. And in that, we would believe in God who raised him from the dead. He's just simply talking about the glorious plan of salvation and how this should be a motivation. It should be a motivation for us to consider all that God did for us. That's why I want to live for him. Now, have you heard the illustration of the cart and the horse? Yeah, you got the horse and the cart. And let me tell you something about the way that horses and carts work. The cart has to be behind the horse. If you put the cart in front of the horse, it doesn't work. Now, in this illustration, the horse is all that Jesus is and all that Jesus did to rescue us. Peter mentions it so many times right here. Of the precious blood of Christ, Lamb without blemish, foreordained from before the foundation of the world, um, manifest in the last time, raised from the dead, on and on. The the person working Jesus Christ, that's the horse. 
What follows behind the horse? Our commitment to living a righteous life in Jesus Christ. The horse draws the cart. Our constant temptation in Christian living is to put the cart before the horse. To think that Jesus is pleased with us or Jesus rescues us because of our holy living. And that's not it. He, he did his free gift. We're to respond to all he's done to us by our righteous life. Verse 22, since you've purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever because all flesh is grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. Now notice this, he says, look, since, I love how he begins that verse 20, since you've purified your soul, listen, Peter's like saying, "I, I know I've been telling you to be holy, I know I've been telling you to have a passion for purity in your Christian life, he goes, I know you're there. I know you want to do that. But, but let me add one more thing to you. It's almost as if Peter's saying, you, you want to, been wanting to know what to do. Now I'm telling you what to do. Live holy. But then second, do you notice what he says here in verse 22? Love one another fervently. Holy living is incomplete if it's not accompanied with love. Now, there's a problem in the Christian world, and it is not a new problem. I think it's a problem that's existed from the very beginning. It just matters what end of the problem you're on. The problem goes something like this. There's holy living, and there's fervent love. We always want to emphasize one or the other. Now, right now, we're in a love age. Man, the important thing is that we love. It's all community. It's all relationships. And listen, all that's important to God. Does God want us to love? Yes, he does. But does he also want us to be holy? You better believe it. Now, in previous, I don't know, generations or ages, whatever you want to call it, those have been holy ages. You got to be holy. Your life has to be right. Stop doing that. Start doing this. You know, emphasis on holiness. Is that good? Does God want us to be holy? You better believe he does. But not to the exclusion of love. Now, right now, I pray that the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart one word. It's the word you need to hear. I pray he's even speaking more love or more holiness. Now, we we both need all of those more. It's not like we can ignore one or the other. But isn't it just usually a fact in our life we're more deficient in one than the other? I love how Peter puts this. Yes, pursue that holiness, but love one another fervently with a pure heart through, verse 23, the word of God which lives and abides forever. And then he ends with this great confidence in the word of God. I love this verse 24. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord lives or endures forever. (laughs) Peter here is quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. And as he quotes here, we see that his word has been fulfilled. Ladies and gentlemen, the word of the Lord certainly has endured. Think about it, for centuries, the only way that the word was transmitted was by people making copies by hand. Now that's that's a, a tenuous line, but God beautifully preserved his word through all the centuries that it had to be copied by hand. In those years, it was persecuted 
vigorously. There were Roman emperors that made it virtually their life mission to burn every copy of the scriptures they could find. It survived centuries of ever-changing philosophies, all kinds of critics. It, it survived centuries of neglect. The, the, the word of God has survived centuries of neglect in the church from both the pulpit and the pew. And today, what do we hear? A bunch of people on a Wednesday night listening, learning, paying attention to the Bible. Truly, the word of the Lord endures forever. In the year 303 AD, the Roman Emperor Diocletian demanded that every copy of the scriptures in the Roman Empire be burned. That was his imperial decree. Well, he failed in that, obviously. 25 years later, the Roman Emperor Constantine commissioned a scholar named Eusebius to prepare 50 copies of the scriptures at government expense. It endures forever. Let me read you this quote from Charles Spurgeon. God's word never dies. God's word never changes. There are some who think we ought to get a new gospel every few years or upon every few weeks. But that was not Peter's notion. He wrote and he was divinely inspired to write concerning the word of God which lives and abides forever. Now, what should it result in in us? I'll leave you with those two things. Holy living and fervent love one for another. I'll let God speak to your heart as to which one he wants to work on more. Right? We're not gonna exclude either one. We want more of both. But if there's a greater need in one area or another, let's let God speak to our hearts about that right now. Father in heaven, we just collectively now as a congregation, we want to take a quiet moment and invite you to speak to our heart because, Lord, we, we don't want to be deficient in either area. So, Lord, speak to us about these areas of holy living and fervent love as we wait upon you in silence just for a moment. Father, thank you for the inheritance that we have in you. It's absolutely incorruptible. Thank you for the heavenly hope that you give us. And Lord, thank you even for the grief uh, that we sometimes bear out of necessity in your plan. We praise you for it together, Lord, in Jesus' name.